Good evening, and welcome to Join the Discussion, a monthly show about senior health and wellness. My name is Madeline Franchese. I am the Vice President of Marketing and Development at Hebrew Senior Care, formerly known as Hebrew Healthcare. Thanks for joining us tonight. Our guest tonight is Heber Heather Dobbert. Heather is a licensed clinical social worker and ha was a youth volunteer in 1989 at Hebrew Healthcare. And that experience formed the beginning of her professional career. It defined the area she would focus in. And as you'll see tonight when we interview her and talk to her, why she cares so much about seniors. Heather has come back to Hebrew Senior Care as the director of our Dementia Care Services. As I mentioned, she's a certified licensed clinical social worker. She is trained in both individual and group counseling. She's also a certified dementia care practitioner and provides education and counseling throughout the state to individuals, caregivers, and families, as well as organizations. Heather, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Madeline. So, you and I work in senior care we all do. day long, and we're very comfortable, although my introductions aren't always smooth, and <laughs> <laughs> we're, in, we're comfortable talking about topics. Yes. And, and um, talking about senior health and cognitive impairment and dementia, yeah. not that it's easy for us to do, but we understand it and we're sure. comfortable in the topic. Um, not everybody has that comfort level, and I want to talk about it from the context of going back maybe 40 years. In the 70s, when people were diagnosed first with cancer, right. and I remember it, my mother had cancer, and it was sort of a quiet thing. You know, it was a little, she has a big C, you right. know, you right. said, yes, yeah, she has right. cancer, and you whispered right. even. And, and I remember a time when you really <clears throat> didn't, you didn't want to have anybody know, you didn't share. Do you think cognitive impairment has become that for us today? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it definitely has. Um, we've all had that moment. Um, I can't find my keys. Could I have dementia? <laughs> this morning. Right. <laughs> um, and I think it's important that we remember that as the brain ages, there are certain normal age-related changes that happen in the brain, and that is very different than having dementia. Mm -hmm. And so I think when folks norm notice those normal changes happening, they panic and they yeah. sort of shut down and, and don't want to have that conversation. Um, it is normal to have difficulty finding the word once in a while, right? It is normal to have more difficulty completing complex tasks versus when you were in your 20s and 30s. You know, it is normal. It is normal to become a little bit more overwhelmed in a very busy, chaotic situation versus when you were younger. Um, sometimes forgetting where you put something when you're overwhelmed and have a lot on your mind. All of that is normal. Um, I'm a social worker. I hate numbers. So I can imagine that as I get older, balancing my checkbook, um, especially if I start with an early dementia, is going to be very difficult for me because that's not something I'm strong with at my baseline. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about dementia, we're talking about symptoms. We're talking about um, changes in thinking, changes in memory, changes in judgment. There's many different medical conditions that cause that dementia and that's the other piece for people to understand um, no two people that develop a cognitive impairment are the same um, you know when we talk about dementia we talk about Alzheimer's disease right and talk and about so, actually can you break that out yeah. a little bit because Alzheimer's is a kind of dementia right. and I know right. there are many others right. so talk about the words that the consumers hearing now you've right. got Alzheimer's you have dementia right. cognitive impairment right can right. you just yep, separate those out for definitely. us a bit? So we have um, different types of dementia. We have dementia uh, caused by Alzheimer's disease, which is a more um, gradual type of progression where plaques and tangles are forming in the brain. Um, we have vascular dementia, which okay. happens when folks have mini strokes, major strokes. So it's more of a um, cardiovascular. Hardening of the arteries. Hardening of the is arteries, what, yeah. right. I'm so, dating myself. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that, that's an often a cause. And a lot of folks have a mixed dementia. They have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Uh, there's dementia associated with Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. with chronic alcoholism, uh, with traumatic brain injury. Oh. So when we say the word dementia, it doesn't tell us a whole lot about that person because okay. it's such a broad term. 
Um, you know, when we look at the warning signs of, of dementia, these are the things that people want to be on the lookout for to have that conversation with their doctor. Um, are their memory changes interfering with their daily routine? So this isn't just forgetting what I had for breakfast, but is it impacting my daily life? It's like I am um, driving home and all of a sudden I'm really sort of don't know where exactly. I am. Exactly. Like exactly. just for a second? Is right. that normal? Or so, can you not extrapolate? I mean, I know. I don't want to put you under the gun. Yeah, you know, if it starts it's to like, happen more often, you mm -hmm. know, if it's a place that you are familiar with and that you've been driving to every day for 10 years and then all of a sudden you're having a hard time retracing your steps mm -hmm. on how to get back to that okay. spot, that would be a concern. Um, becoming confused about the date, about the time. Um, now, this isn't just, you know, okay, is it the 16th or the 17th, but right. okay, is, is it, it Sunday or Monday? You know, and, and <laughs> is, it, is it 2017 or 2015? Um, you know, changes in social awareness and judgment are, are a concern sometimes too. So if, if mom or dad all of a sudden is saying really strange things at really strange times and seems to not really have that social filter going on okay. that we all have, um, that's something that we want to look at. So um, if they can be louder, inappropriate, say things right. that they normally would keep in their head, right? but say, wow, that dress is too tight. Exactly. You know? <laughs> You're, you're, out at, you're out at lunch and, you know, they're especially inappropriate with the waitress or say something very snarky to the waitress and that okay. was never their way. But keep in mind that it's important to keep in mind the person's baseline, what was normal for them. Right. So if they had normal personality characteristics their whole life, those may continue. Or into their, be exacerbated exactly. with the filter going away. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, that could definitely happen. It, it's also important to assess for depression, right? So there's a lot of um, depression symptoms that can look like dementia in an older person. Mm -hmm. If my attention span is starting to go, if I'm having a hard time focusing, if I'm more withdrawn from activities that are challenging, that may actually be a sign of depression, not dementia. So when it is treated with the appropriate medications and psychotherapy management, the person's functioning can improve. So it's important to have that conversation with your healthcare provider. It, it, it's certainly a complex, yep. just, just like any illness, but yeah. this illness in particular um, affects people who are 65 and older in aging. I mean, yes, you have early onset. What Definitely. would you define early onset as? Early if, onset would, well, you know, there's there's cases of folks having dementia in their 30s and 40s, which is especially mm. tragic given um, mm everything that's going on in your life at that time. Um, but yes, typically in the 50s, 60s, prior to age 65, the person Early. being diagnosed. Right, right. So yeah. it's a progressive disease. Yep. It can't be reversed or cured yet. I right. know there is attention being paid yep. to it now. Yep. Definitely. Um, I think if I remember correctly, it's one of the top 10 illnesses that is the least funded and there's absolutely no right. Right. cure for right. that's in the top 10. So it's, it's you know, when you look at the, the statistics with the Alzheimer's Association, mm -hmm. it's the sixth leading cause of death, right? So it's not always listed as the cause of death on the person's right. death certificate exactly. because of course they have so many other issues happening. Um, but you know, knowledge really is power. It, it is so important to have that discussion with your doctor. Well, that's what I was going to say. So yeah. if it can't be reversed and it can't right. be cured, why get a diagnosis other than the obvious? Right. Well, you know, what are you going to do about it? It does a couple things. So the first thing that it does is it helps you regain a little bit of control. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you think about stress in general, when we are stressed out in our life, it typically happens when we are out of control of something. Things are not going the way that we want them to go, the way that we plan for them to go. So by finding out what you're dealing with and getting knowledge about mm. what the future may hold and what you need to do, mm. it puts you back in the driver's seat of your own health. You know, um, there's also a lot of very treatable, reversible conditions that look like dementia, but are not. And, th and that's something I think I want the viewer to hear very right. loud and strong. Right, right. Don't be afraid. Right, I mean, right. you are. Of course. But and that's, and right. that's, that's be, a normal You wouldn't be human feeling. if you weren't afraid. Of but, course, of course. But there are other answers to this question. There are. So if there you are. don't go to the, your doctor and if you're not honest with your family. Right, right. You, you could, could have missing. a cure or something exactly. resolved and exactly and there, you, you could be it. missing a very very appropriate treatment for what's happening um, delirium related to illness what is delirium delirium, delirium is um, you know when the person has a, a change in their mental status that deviates from how they normally are right and it's very unpredictable versus with dementia um, the person has certain patterns and things that will happen with their behavior throughout the day delirium is very sudden right so if I go to 
the hospital and I'm there for a hip replacement mm -hmm. and I go under general anesthesia, I come out of that general anesthesia, um, I am going to have a hard time recovering from that that piece, right? So I'm going to be not quite at my baseline, right? So um, the delirium does typically improve over time. It, does it present <clears throat> like dementia delirium? It does, it does. But again, it's a little bit more erratic, right? So the person may have certain behaviors and changes that are a little bit more unpredictable and all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, typically, um, you know, you're trying to keep things as consistent as possible for that person um, because we know that when we keep the routine consistent, they can function at a higher mm -hmm. level, which is, is tough when there's a lot of medical issues going on. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, infections, vitamin deficiencies, metabolic disorders, thyroid problems, problems. Mm. So many people suffer from thyroid issues, myself included. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to stay on top of that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, side effects from medications. Um, as you get older, you will inevitably be seeing different types of specialists. You will have your cardiologist, you may have your endocrinologist, you have your primary care doctor. It is important that they're all talking to each other. It is important that each knows what the other is prescribing because there's a lot of medication interactions. So who's the gatekeeper of that list. Um, the, right. Is it the patient? Is it the patient family? Is yeah. it the primary care guy? Yeah. Ultimately, um, I, I like to empower families to be the gatekeeper because mm -hmm. you would like to be able to, of course, rely on your primary care doctor, which you, you should feel that you have trust in your primary care physician. But it's important for uh, patients and families to understand their own care and what's going mm -hmm. on. Um, it's important to have that conversation. It's important to ask questions. Um, it's important to run everything through your primary care doctor, mm -hmm. right? So if you go to a specialist and that specialist makes a treatment recommendation, it's very important that your primary care doctor who knows you best understands what mm -hmm. that recommendation is and that they kind of give you the green light, okay, this is a good idea or maybe this is not such a good idea. Um, and also just making sure that, um, that you're taking advantage of any medications that might help the condition. Mm -hmm. So we know there's no cure. We right. know that there's no medication, there's no pill you're gonna take that's gonna change the trajectory of the illness. But we do know that there's certain medications that can help preserve brain functioning for as long as possible. Okay, talk, right? and, and again, <clears throat> you hear a lot on TV and sure. ads now that sort of this silver tsunami is coming our yeah. way. Yeah, um, yeah you know, the market is sort of ripe for right. good information and not so good information. Right. So right. Right. how do we know eating food X is going to really right. help my brain function right. versus right. taking a vitamin that says that? Right. How are we right. evaluating these options? You know, the research is there that what's good for our heart is good for our head, mm -hmm. right? So if we know that it's good for our hearts um, and good for our heads, if we're trying to prevent heart attack, if we're mm -hmm. trying to prevent stroke, we know that ways that we do that are to manage all of those key values, mm -hmm. our blood pressure, our cholesterol, our blood sugar. Um, our weight, you know, making sure that we're not putting ourselves at risk for having a stroke. Mm -hmm. If we know that vascular dementia is, I forget if it's the second or third most common type of dementia mm -hmm. now, if we know it's that, that significant, wow. how can we prevent strokes from happening? So in some ways, even though we can't prevent vascular dementia, we could prevent we can, the scenario that gets you there. Right. Maybe. We can reduce our risk factors, you know, mm -hmm. for developing that condition. Um, but again, it, it's not that very few people, to my knowledge, and the, the research I've done, have just one strict type of mm. dementia. So a lot of folks have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, so it is important to, to maintain, again, what's good for the heart is good for the head. Okay. Um, and keeping yourself stimulated, keeping yourself cognitively stimulated, socially active. Um, we know we have this term now called neuroplasticity, where we are not just stuck with the brain cells that we have upon mm. diagnosis of dementia, that we can still form new neural pathways, that we can still preserve functioning. Mm -hmm. So the more stimulated that we are, the more that we're doing things out of the ordinary, take a class, learn a new language, mm. brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand, <laughs> um, change the order that you do things in the oh, morning wow. and okay. kind of change it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are very much creatures of habit. Well, you know, it's you funny because as you're saying that, and I know you have two beautiful children, and you know, from the moment you're a parent, you're telling your kids, you know, we got to get into our routine, right? right? right. <laughs> All that routine, routine. And yeah. now here we find ourselves 50 years into that routine being told, you know, 
Not so much. Right. That right. routine maybe is not a good idea. Right. You know, change it up. And it's, you know, it is, it is kind of contradictory if you think about <laughs> it because when you look at the person with dementia, you know that consistency and routine is their friend. Exactly. Right? So you, you have certain consistency in their routines and schedules that are good. But at the same time, you want to be introducing. So it's not like you're throwing out what's known just to mm -hmm. introduce what's new. You're holding on to what the person's comfortable with and you're adding little things here and there just to kind of keep them engaged. Engaged and stimulated. Yes, exactly, um, exactly. What advice do you have for caregivers on being proactive in terms of their loved one's health care? Definitely. Or if mom and dad has dementia, what are the specialized <coughs> care options that they right. could be researching? Yep, yep. I recommend that people um, become comfortable with the Alzheimer's Association mm -hmm. website. It's a fabulous uh, organization. It really is. It it's, really a great, is. it's a great uh, tool. They also have uh, something called Trial Match on the website that can connect families and people with dementia with clinical trials. Oh, great. So the person okay. has the opportunity to not only um, become engaged in a trial for their for themselves, but to mm. participate in something bigger than them, to really mm. participate in the cause and to really get involved. And there have been commercials about that, actually. Yeah. I, yeah. The, that man who says, you know, I may not be the benefit right. of right. this, but I'm helping for the future. Right, right. And, that is and if powerful. you think about it, that we all, that's what we all want, right? We all, we all want to leave things a little bit better mm -hmm. for the generation that's coming. So being part of a trial, and, and I've spoken with many people who have been a part of trials, and I've gotten nothing but positive feedback. Mm. Um, the extra attention and sort of care support group and like support. as well. Exactly. You know, it, it's, it's just so much support for that person. It's really fantastic. Does it build up your hope? I mean, how, how do people reconcile yeah, that part yeah, of it? Yeah. I think you have to have hope, yeah. right? You, you, you have do. to have hope. When, when you don't have hope, that's a very dark place to be when, mm -hmm. there, when there's no hope. Um, I think that, you know, when it comes to um, researching senior care options like you had asked, I think that it's important that people plan. I'm a big fan of planning. When you start planning? You know, you start I'm planning. I'm 57 soon. Should I be planning? <laughs> <laughs> be careful of your answer. <laughs> Yeah, I think that we yes, never yes. <laughs> we, we never know what the future holds, right? Sure. Tomorrow is not promised. So, God forbid, I should get into an accident tomorrow, knock on wood. Um, I want my husband, I want my family to know and understand what I want done mm -hmm. for me if I can't speak for myself. Mm -hmm. So having those conversations early on in your life is extremely important. It's hard to do, but really important. Um, I think that when it comes to dementia care, again, you have to plan. You have to realize the disease is going to change. You have to realize that um, there's a lot of community-based programs and services out there that are at that person's reach, right? Mm. But it's you have to have that conversation. You have to want to reach out. And back to my original yeah. point about yeah. do you think people are scared to reach out because of a few reasons. A, they don't want anyone knowing. B, I think oh my are. God, if mom and dad have it, what does that say about my right. future? Right, um, right. Yeah, I was just what? having a conversation with a family the other day about that, and they said, you know, look, uh, you know, I'm just like my dad. Do you think I'm going to get it? Do you think I'm going to get dementia? And my answer was, I, I don't know. You know, we don't know. What we do know is that genetic link is not the only precursor to dementia, right? Simply living to the age of 85 gives you a one in two chance of developing right, exactly. it. exactly. So family history aside, mm -hmm. that, that's what the statistics show us. But there is so much that we know now that we can do. I mean, back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, there was no heart healthy and Mediterranean diet and you know Correct. yoga and meditation and exercise. There's so many wellness practices that we have now that weren't being done. It's so true. Before. And I think that's one of the shifts in healthcare Definitely. that we're seeing is that people aren't aren't dying from these illnesses. They're living with chronic Correct. illness. Correct. So it's a whole different way to have to cope and, and, and treat and serve. It is. Someone who had a heart condition 50 years ago right. may right. not have lived right. past exactly. 65. Now so, you could have someone in the hospital at Heber Senior Care right, right. who has an underlying heart condition but is there because of exacerbated COPD, right, right. needs a quieter, calmer place to be, right. and then they're going to go home and right. come back for the tune-up. It's right. chronic living with this long-term, right. how do you manage? And, right. and I guess 
cognitive impairment fits into that. It does. It definitely does. You know, we know that um, change for someone with dementia, any change in their routine is, is can be difficult. Mm -hmm. So if I'm 85 years old and I have dementia and I all of a sudden come down with the flu or with pneumonia, okay, that's going to set me back 20 paces compared to how it might set you right Sending back. them out? To a hospital no, just, or any just of it. having the condition itself, yeah. right? So, you know, when the when the doc certainly the doctor has to decide what is most appropriate where that person should be. But it's important for families to be empowered to understand that there's options, right? So that there are senior care hospitals mm -hmm. out there like right, like, like Hebrew the senior, senior care. Senior care. Um, How's where, it different? How's the hospital? It's different? different. It's it's smaller. It's quieter. It's it's what we would call a, a therapeutic environment. Mm. It's not the chaos, the busyness. It's what, a you specialty. Know, Hospital, it's a specialty. It really is. You know, we all have the stories of bringing our loved ones to the ER and sitting there for umpteen eight to ten hours so waiting for a bed. So talk about someone with dementia sitting in an ED, yeah, yeah. having a hundred and two fever, right. and waiting ten hours. Right, right. How does that? I so. Mean, the person with dementia is going to automatically respond to something not being right in their body. So they are perhaps going to yell. They are perhaps going to become restless. They are going to act out. <clears throat> they are going. Environment. They're going to become. They're going to be labeled as that difficult patient. Combative. Combative. Resistive. Argumentative. Ag agitated. And unfortunately, in the typical emergency room, they don't have the staff. They don't have the. Well, I shouldn't say they don't have the staff. It's not their model to be dementia care focused, mm -hmm. right? Well, it's not the first thing they're dealing. With. Exactly. You're They're with putting a lot a fire. of other right. And the hospital you seen your care, of course, doesn't have an OR. It doesn't have an emergency right. department. Right. Right. It's a direct admit through your physician. So, right. talk about for just a brief moment, because yeah. I know we have a lot to cover. Still. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how would that admission be different for right. someone with dementia? Right. It would be much more streamlined. It would be much more comfortable for that person. So, you know, the uh, family or the ambulance company brings them right in and they go straight to their room. So they're immediately mm. greeted by their nurse. They're immediately greeted by their care team. Their care is overseen by a geriatrician, right? Dr. Panulo is our medical director. Big difference because Huge. if you don't know seniors, yeah. it's yeah. like not know. it's like taking your child. When right. I was a child, my parents took me to a general practitioner. Right. Right. Of course I took our children to a pediatrician. Right, right. Why exactly. wouldn't we specialize exactly. at a time of senior? Typically, oh. when you so when you go to the hospital, people will say, "Well, I want to go to a hospital where my doctor goes." Well, that right. doesn't happen anymore, right? That's so true. Hospitals have hospitalists. Not nothing against hospitalists. No, at not all. at all. The model um, of hospitals is changing. changing. Definitely, definitely. So when you come to the hospital at Hebrew Healthcare, you you know who your doctor is. Mm -hmm. She's going to be there every day that you come in to visit exactly. mom and dad. You're going to be able to have that conversation with her about what you're noticing. She's going to hear you. She's going to listen to you. That that is very different from the typical experience at the well, hospital. Well, there's a, the, the hospital at Hebrew Senior Care has only 23 beds right. for the medical unit, right. so they're right. in. Is the it, difference it's a whole different ballgame? Well, good to know. Yeah. So I'm glad you did yeah. bring this up. Yeah. Um, I want to talk for just a bit. I mentioned about the silver tsunami. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> scary stats: 40% uh, growth in individuals age 65 and older between 210 and. Yep. I'm sorry, 210. Yep. 2010 and 2025. Over the next 20 years, um, yeah. the population of 65 and plus will grow by 57%. Right. Um, that's me. <laughs> uh, add to those stats every day, 8,000 people turn 65 right. for the next 18 years. What does this mean for people with dementia? How do you predict healthcare changing and evolving in the coming years? It means that we need to get better at senior care. Right, it, it's not something that can be secondary anymore. Uh, they they have to be the group that is at the forefront of everything that we do, mm. right? So we have to be developing models of care that meet their specific needs, right? And failure to do so will just be so devastating. Um, you know, we, we this this it is it's a healthcare crisis. It really is. You know, um, the baby boomers they they will they are expecting they will be demanding. Well, exactly. Better care. Right? Let me, then let's jump because, oh boy, if you could believe it, you're going to have to come back. We're almost running out of time already. Um, and I didn't even get to some of the questions I really want to ask you. So you're a licensed geriatric social worker right. and you are in the Connecticut Geriatric Specialty Group. Right, right. Which is an outpatient physician practice yep. connected with Hebrew Senior yep. Care. Yeah. Um, you offer dementia care consultations. I do. Talk about that. And yep. I know we're, we're down to like the last five minutes. No worries. Um, how can a person with dementia or what can a family expect? Walk me through the process. 
if they have a visit, insurance. Right, 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 right. Um, and in that, what do you offer people facing the disease? Right. You know, so, you... so in care consultations, I'm trying to understand the experience from the perspective of the person with dementia and the family, right? Because everybody's experience is so incredibly different. So when they come to me, what are their goals? What do they want to get out of this care consultation? Um, the end result of the consultation is that we assemble a, you know, recommendations that are going to hopefully make this person's life easier and make them be able to move through the stages of the disease with a little bit more ease. So, you know, basically it's a very relaxed process. You come into my office or sometimes depending on the person's location, I can visit them in the home. Um, we perform some basic tests, some cognitive testing, and that can make people a little bit mm -hmm. nervous. Um, people don't like being under the gun. They don't like being tested. Um, but it, they're really, they only have to answer what they're comfortable answering. I'm not going to make someone and perform. And this is at 1 Abrams Boulevard Correct. at Heber Senior Care. Right. Okay. So I have an office um, at Connecticut Geriatric mm -hmm. Specialty Group right within Hebrew Senior Care. Um, and so we, we basically, you know, go through some tests. We figure out where the person's at. We kind of look at what the stage is of their dementia mm -hmm. to understand where their strength are and where their challenges are. Seven stages? Are. Seven stages, right? So we, we go through the different stages and, and the testing that I do helps kind of decide what stage the person is at at that time. And then from there, you're making a care plan with the family. Correct. They can call you. Right. Um, is this right. covered by insurance? Is it, it is. Private? Oh, great. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. So it's covered by insurance. We accept Medicare and many other um, insurance companies. So I just encourage folks to call me to discuss the insurance options. Okay. But chances are we do take their insurance plan. Um, you know, we talk about the person's life history, we talk about caregiver stress, we talk about how to access respite services, support services. Right, because even um, at the hospital at Hebrew Senior Care, we do provide what respite. Right. There. Because right. you, right. you do need a break. This is Definitely. very demanding. Definitely. It's very um, difficult. It's very, very difficult. demanding caregiving. We also have a senior day center right. that people could take advantage of. But right. I think the important messages is mm. you need to take advantage of these, these services. Definitely. And if you are a child with a parent who has an issue or a spouse and you can't get them there comfortably mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. they don't want to go right. or they're resistant. Right. Can that person call you for help and advice to get the process going? Definitely. definitely. I am always just a phone call away. I am happy to have a conversation with anybody that just sort of needs a uh, you know, point in the right direction. I'm happy to do that. What do you think is, um, would you say is the number one issue facing families that you work with? Probably driving. <laughs> That's a whole show on itself. Yeah, it, probably. It, it really is. Oh um, my, taking, yes. You know what? I'm going to ask you to come back and talk about driving. Definitely. Because that is a, yeah. Um, yeah. a most difficult. Yeah. Is that the most difficult question to answer for people? You know what? It, it is. I, I think the most difficult question that I get from folks is how much time do I have with my loved one? What oh. can I expect next? And unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball, right? So this disease has robbed the person of so many memories from their past, and we're so worried about what's going to happen in the future. The best advice that I can give someone and to their family is to try to be as present as possible, to mm. live every moment, to really take advantage of the support and the resources out there, and to really take every opportunity to live life to the fullest because we don't know. We don't know what the future holds, and but but we have control over right now. And during That's the holiday we season, we're not even going to get to that. All the yeah. stress around the holidays, yeah. try and take it down, make it streamlined, make Definitely. it calm. This this is a, a topic and a health care issue that we are going to have to be talking about yes. a lot. Um, yeah. I know you have agingcareacademy.org uh, also people yeah. could go to if they'd like to yeah. uh, learn more. Um, also, if you have questions for Heather, please email me at jointhediscussion at hebrewseniorcare.org and we will collect your questions and I will get Heather to answer them. Um, also, if you would like to suggest a future topic for Join the Discussion, please email me at jointhediscussion uh, at hebrewseniorcare.org as well as checking out our website at hebrewseniorcare.org. Heather, it's been a pleasure having you today. Pleasure is mine. There, is, there are, again, so many questions that we didn't get there to. There are. Um, I'm going to real quick, I think we maybe have 20 seconds, um, top tips to your own parents. As a specialist, what is in your head? What's like the number one, two tip that you would tell people? Talk, communicate. Um, have the discussions early, have the discussions before you're in crisis, because if you're waiting to have them when you're finally in a crisis, mm. it's a lot harder to problem solve, it really is. And to just ask for help, to ask for the help that's there. Okay, and, yeah. and again, um, if you have any concerns or questions, 
or if you need to speak with Heather Daubert, please reach out at Hebrew Senior Care. She can be, what's your phone number, 860? Yeah, my phone number is 860-920-1810. Okay, that number, 860-920-1810. Um, you can call Heather and schedule a consult yeah. um, or just talk to her about what you need to do. Or if you're watching tonight and you work at a health care agency or a home care agency, Heather also does training yes. for staff so that we can all treat the people we need to treat appropriately and respectfully. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. I look forward to seeing you next month. And again, if you have questions, email me at join the discussion at Hebrew Senior Care. In the meantime, have a wonderful Thanksgiving and a terrific holiday season.